Nice walk on music. Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hi, Mitchell. Hello. Um, we're lucky to have today the uh, chief lizard wrangler of Mozilla, in addition to the title that Ann told you about. So, what is a lizard wrangler? <laughs> you know, Mozilla has a mascot. It's a dino slash lizard from long ago, from our beginnings. And uh, chief lizard wrangler is just meant to express that I'm the started as the general manager, now I'm the chair, so decision maker, uh, and that it's not a standard company with employees. Mozilla's a nonprofit, it's always had volunteers, and the leadership role is management of employees, but leadership for a set of people who aren't employees, and so they have to choose to spend time and energy because they think Mozilla is useful to their goals, uh -huh. and that's different than being a manager with all the tools of employment. Okay. So all that's right. the beginning. All right, good. So, um, well, that skill, I'm sure, yeah. comes in handy, managing reptiles of all kinds. Um, I hope so. I, I, I'm not sure that everybody in the audience knows the difference between Mozilla Foundation and Mozilla Corporation. Could you explain a little bit how, about how it works, where the money comes from, sure. what it is, that the, the purpose of the organization? Sure. So the heart of Mozilla is a nonprofit with the mission of building the part of the internet that's a global public resource, one that's open and accessible to everyone, regardless of location or demographics. And so that's a classic public benefit mission. And so we're technically a 501c3 nonprofit, and, and everything we do is aimed at the mission. We have a more complex legal structure, partly because we do earn revenue through Firefox, and in the United States, the way you earn revenue is related to your nonprofit status. So everything rolls up to the foundation, but, but we have a corporation that produces Firefox and pays taxes and does all that stuff. Okay. But and generally, the, we're all trying to build the mission. And the source of revenue for, uh, for the corporation is? Well, there's two sources. So there's, there's a few different sources, but the main one through Firefox is ads through search, like the web. And then our other programs are fellowships for news and science and web literacy and inclusion and women in tech. Those come through both donations and private funders. OK, so good. Mix for different programs. All yeah. right. Um, the Mozilla Foundation is, uh, in, intends to uphold the principles of a Mozilla manifesto. Yes. Uh, a manifesto that, whose principles are things that I'm sure everyone in this summit agrees with. However, a lot of those principles are under siege uh, by the way the w internet has been evolving and a number of yeah. actors have tried to take advantage of it. I'd, I'd like, as a way to organize this talk about the future of the internet, to talk about the principles of the manifesto, because I think that's the way we'd all like the internet to play. We'd like that future to be the future that the manifesto envisions? Oh, well, that's, that's an interesting question and, and dear to my heart. So for those who don't know it. Well, I could, I, let, let's go through the, I'm going to go through principle by principle since. Oh, my goodness. All right, so are you ready? Well, I, I'm going do to you want me to respond to each or are you just going to I read want, no, I want you to tell me how we're doing on that measure. Oh. <laughs> okay? Okay. Are you ready? Yeah. All right, here we go. So principle number two, um, very close to the heart of Mozilla, is that the internet is a global public resource that must remain open and accessible. Now, that is under threat, you could argue, by the FCC chairman's apparent willingness to embrace uh, differential pricing for the internet and a number of other things. So, rating yourself, at rating yourself, rating the future of the internet on the basis of open and accessible, how are we doing? Well, I, I, so first of all, let me say the Mozilla Manifesto is aspirational. It sets out the world we want. Like, and so, um, uh, open and accessible, I'd say since it's written, you know, a billion and a half more people are online and, and engaging, and so there's some really positive stuff there. And of course, uh, is it really open? Mm, probably less so than it was. So we have a whole new range of questions. You know, at the time, it was pretty clear what it meant. when. But uh, so I would say, you know, I think it's going to be true on many of these, hopeful in some ways and like not hopeful in others. Uh -huh. You know, I will say that I am 
engaged in a project to extend the manifesto to speak about the aspirations. You know, we have this saying from long ago, you know, we love the web. But new generations don't even use the term the web, or they don't know what it is. And then, like the last billion people often doesn't know what the internet is, right? It's Facebook. I mean, literally. Yes. So, so we love the web is a, is a period for, for, you know, it's a state for some of us. Uh, but, but when I think about it, what is it that we love? There's the technology, there's the opportunity, there's the you can be anywhere and try something new and reach people. Used to be unlimited without, you know, some company in the middle of it. And I think, though, the aspirations of the web were more human as well. You know, why do we love the web? But well, we had a set of aspirations about the great things that could happen. Some of those we see. You know, there is innovation. Uh, increasingly, I think the App Store model doesn't work for very many people. So, we, you know, we need a new layer of it. But, it, you know, we imagined that the, the web was a tool for collaboration, you know, for learning, for innovation in a decentralized way where you didn't have someone in the middle of you and your customers. And for, I would say, global problem solving. And those things, they're happening. But as you point out, the last few years are also showing us the expression of the web for the, the poorer side of human nature. How to incite violence, how to, how to uh, manipulate people, how to engage in a range of behaviors that have nothing to do with our aspirations. And yes. all too much to do with being human, I think. Let me ask you a policy question in, in yeah. uh, regard to this. What about net neutrality and some of the statements coming out of the, the American FCC? Yeah. So I'm going to put net neutrality and the U.S. setting in a slightly broader context about what I would call affordable and equal access or a neutral access on, on a more global level. And so we have a bunch of issues there. And in part, I would say the open internet or open web group sort of failed uh, because it was all too easy to say, oh, net neutrality, yes, and if you don't have enough capital to pay for it, well, too bad for you. Or just wait, you know. So, so I think we could have done better. Uh, and so the response is now limited access globally and metered or differential access in the United States. Yes. You know, all of which I think is the easy way out, but not the right way out. Right. And, and so for most basics, you know, many countries have a subsidized baseline level in electricity, sometimes in water, in the US in telephone service, might well be an internet service. Like the research that we've done uh, and that we've seen particularly in India, which rejected uh, uh, Facebook controlled, you know, free basics kind of uh, system, was that, that people, including people with limited incomes who cannot afford unlimited access, what they want is their access limited by time but not by content, uh -huh. right? And so if you're actually going to sponsor some sort of baseline level, the key aspect is time. Because human beings are smart everywhere, and if, if people can, who don't have capital to pay, you know, have a limit and it's time, they can allocate according to what they need or what they want. Uh, and, and, and so that's an issue that we just have to address with an act of, I think, an act of will. And, and I would put the FCC, you know, it's at the other end of the spectrum of what happens to people who do have resources. Uh, and even if we are paying or paying a lot for the system, what do we actually get? And, and I think the FCC is heading back to a system the United States knows very well. We call it cable TV. <laughs> and we hate it. And, and we know what it looks like. Uh, and, uh, you know, allowing the internet to be converted into a 20th century model would, you know, it's going to be a real loss. And, and trying to recover from it will be long and steep. Just like I think the, the parts of the world that take the easier route, the free basics route, it will be a long recovery period for their citizens to actually understand the riches of the web or the internet and find their way into it. Great, thank you. Um, yeah. Another principle, principle number five, I believe, is individual security and privacy on the internet are at fundamental and must not be treated as optional. Would you say that the battle to preserve privacy on the web is already lost? Well, there's two things in there. There's security and there's privacy. Yes. 
Uh, you know, I just wrote it originally with security because I thought your sense of security depends on, you know, your sense of privacy, but it's become important to identify them separately. So there's two things there. We have security issues and we have privacy issues. Uh, the security of the system is clearly inadequate, right? And being exploited by state actors, by black hats, by commercial organizations. And so I think we've seen in the last couple of years, we've seen the beginning of a serious effort to really address that. In fact, on center stage, you know, Brad Smith yesterday made a truly impassioned plea about cybersecurity and the role of citizens and corporations in really addressing the system-wide level. And, and that's an area where we have cybersecurity and then it gets wrapped up with backdoors and encryption in very complex ways. And so it's easy to get distracted. Uh, and I think the path of sorry, the liberal Western governments to want to limit encryption so they can have backdoors is uh, deeply disturbing on two levels. There's the individual liberty that we think of as the heart of Western democracies, and yet we find them adopting statutes that sound like the statutes in China. <laughs> you know, they're, they're very, very similar. So we have the concerns about the relationship of the individual to the state, but we also have the idea, you know, the, the reality that once you add a back door, and, uh, it is very unsafe. And so we have the safety concerns, which have a deep technical aspect, uh, which I, I think we're starting to actually re-engage around. And certainly in the United States, it, it, we're limited because we end up in this fight where governments about national security crime, we need back doors, and we, we're not making progress on the underlying cybersecurity issue because that knot is there. And so either we have to figure it out or some other part of the world, which isn't having that fight, needs to figure it out because the encryption piece is fundamental. Then we have the privacy piece. And I think for some generation, certain amount of privacy is, I think, gone. Like what the future is like and can we reclaim it or how do we reclaim it is, is an issue. And I, I think this attention economy and what we're learning about how easy the attention economy makes it to manipulate people, uh, that may be the thing that forces us to change, right? It turns out, Lots of people say they want privacy, but most of us trade it for convenience and free things really quickly. And we haven't solved this abstract privacy convenience, but uh, tracking, manipulation, creation of civil strife, fueling both sides of an issue to create violence, those are much less abstract than privacy. And so um, those things may, in fact, help us figure out what we want to reclaim. Uh, because the attention economy is where all the money is right now and where the energy is and taking data, you know, to fuel that economy. And sometimes I think, are we creating an addiction economy? Right, and, and addictions are fun when they're entertainment for a while, but, but we know that addictions go side by side with some destructive behavior. Yes. Bad for the individual, bad for society. And I, I think, I'm hopeful that the tech industry now will be more open to sort of social science research about what's happening. And I would love to be wrong that attention economy does not equal addiction economy. But, but if it does or it shares traits in common, then like understanding what's happening and how easy it is to manipulate people might help us in the long run solve some of these issues. All right, th uh, thank you. Uh, yeah. Let me ask another question from the principles, which is that the internet must enrich the lives of indiv individual human beings. Yeah. And you've addressed that a, a bit with the addiction economy, fears about that. But a yeah. specific question would be about trolling or bullying yep. and are, in your opinion, are the efforts that the platforms are making to, to fight against that, are they adequate? Okay, so I'm gonna go back to the principle for a minute, like enrich the lives of human beings. You know, that's pretty abstract, <laughs> but, it, but it was meant to capture our aspiration that the internet reflects all aspects of our humanity. So there is a principle in there, maybe you'll get to it, about economic activity being critical, being a fundamental driver of growth. So yes, 
And human beings, hopefully, you know, our infrastructure enables us to do things that aren't all about monetizing. You know, as a human being, some things I do are driven by purchases and the fact that people want to monetize it is fine. But a lot of my relations to my community, or maybe it's my church or my faith or my kids or my hobbies, they're not, or, 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 or my health or, you know, my relationship to my government, having all of that driven by how much am I monetizable with each click of it is not healthy, that we know. And so that principle was meant to reflect that that the core of the technology, like, we aspire that it re represents the breadth of humanity, whether or not it, it's generating revenue. So, uh, so okay. uh, you know, and we've seen some great steps forward in the last 10 years and then some really difficult things. So to your particular point, uh, you know, I think we're actually only now just starting to understand the depth of both violence against women everywhere, anywhere, everywhere, uh, uh, just how completely pervasive it is. The violence against um, non-dominant groups, you know, which varies depending on geography. The effort of state actors, uh, currently Russia, but who knows who else, actually, okay. uh, to manipulate people and to engage in propaganda. And uh, the effects of manipulation to keep people interested in, right? The attention economy means you want people happy or engaged in your site. So we're only now beginning to understand that. And so at this point, I think it's pretty clear that the technical responses to it are early. You know, first there was denial, you know, right. Uh, and so I, I think there may be an intellectual understanding now, then you have to get to a much deeper intuitive understanding of how deep the problem is, uh -huh. uh, and then figuring out the answers. So, so I don't think that even the, the tech platforms are anywhere near where they will voluntarily get to as they address this, and then beyond that, whether or not particular governments, you know, require additional activities, uh, we'll see. Uh, you know, I think Zuck was pretty clear that he's going to address some of this stuff. I think the manipulation in election politics. Um, so I don't know if, you know, intent alone, you know, or, or one person's intent is, is really enough or what the business model supports or how much damage to the bottom line in the short term the organization can take. You know, he asserts there will be some, but right. how much and does it work? I don't know. So, so very, very early on. And I think uh, you can say they're not doing enough, or you could say it's unfair that they expect more. You could be any place on that spectrum. And it, I think it's clear to say that we've only seen the very beginning steps. Okay. Um, uh, since the topic of this session is the future of the internet, I'm going to ask you yeah. to make some predictions. So I'd like you to envision a best case scenario five years from now about how people use this amazing public resource and, um, and assign a probability to that best case scenario and then I'll ask for the opposite, obviously. <laughs> okay, best case scenario has a couple components. And one is that we learn how to adapt our technology so that it doesn't magnify hatred and violence. That's pretty clear. And that we see that in practice. I mean, it's a part of human nature, so it's always there. So technology won't solve that. Uh, but, but, but technology does build in interactive methods and styles, and I believe it builds in values, uh, a, a, like attention. Are you happy enough to stay here? That's a value that gets built into technology. So that we've learned enough and have made the turn and have started to see the changes that technology is encouraging. Um, more productive forms of engagement that's currently the case. Two, the liberal Western democracies right, get back to their values and, and stop, uh, uh, you know, stop moving in the direction of total government surveillance all the time and trust me, we're a democracy so we have good intent. Like that intent cannot be institutionalized over generations. So we, ha we have, I mean, immense problems with violence and terrorism and, and the need for policing. 
Like, I am not a libertarian. Like, I believe in government and government functions for people. And, 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 and the murder of civilians as going about their daily business, like, that's a fundamental problem. And at the same time, like, we are democracies for a reason. You know, and Big Brother surveillance and watching is not going to end well. So, you know, we have to get that hopefully addressed in the democracies. And then I think in, in, in the other nations, which don't particularly aspire to democracy, in the best case scenario, we have, uh, we, they, you know, together have learned that, like, the global infrastructure is a fundamental piece of anyone's moving forward, so that turning it off either get, gets more damaging uh, and or there are uh, a more distributed networking base so that it's harder to just turn things off. Uh -huh. And I, I do think that there is a role for mesh and local networks in emergencies and in um, uh, communities and societies where not everything needs to be totally centralized and go through the giant backbone. Now, that's heretical, I will say, in the open Internet space. Uh, and I think that network architecture should not be frozen and fundamental as the core background and the protocols are, like we are moving forward into a new era and we should take the goals of the web and the interoperability that, that we have and move them into new eras of network architecture and management and understanding. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think in a best case, more people would have some sense of what the internet actually is. <laughs> uh, and I'll, I'll stop there for now. Oh, okay. Um, how about that worst case scenario? Oh, I, well, that I would just say big brother. I mean, I think that one's pretty obvious. It's See. total track, tracking and surveillance, and corporate entities and state actors know more about me than I do and know exactly how to manipulate me, uh, which is, as it turns out, for a human being, if you know enough about them, it's not that hard. Right. It, it, it is really not that hard to um, figure out what, what motivates people and, and create it when you can target at such zero cost. Uh, and I would say in about five years' time, in a true worst-case scenario, I would say that the forces that are good at targeting that are obviously ascendant, and that that is a setting of massive civil violence. Right. I mean, we've seen that the Russians, like, they, they have Facebook pages on both sides of the issue, encouraging groups to go to a protest at the same time and fight it out. Like, so that's not that hard to do. And the worst case scenario, there is a ton of that happening. State actors, small local groups, you name it. So let's not end there, though. Oh, like, no, well, please. let's not end there. Please. Well, uh, how about... You know, we have 20 seconds, but don't end so there. So how about the probability? What's the probability of that best case scenario? Oh, God, I don't know. Less than Better 50 percent. No. Less, no. Yeah. I think it's less than 50%, but I am a believer in an act of will. And I am a believer, like I'm a ridiculously naive believer, look at Mozilla, that small groups of people with technical expertise who, who actually care about the values and go out and build stuff can, can, can really, you know, have an impact on what happens. So, so I'm, I'm a, you know, heart on my sleeve, naive optimist that we could actually make a difference and change things. And um, there you go. Okay. That seems like a good place to end it then. Much better. Mitchell, thank you. Mitchell Baker, thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. My pleasure. Thank you. Thank you.